Well, welcome everyone, and thanks so much for joining us here at the Center for Effective Lawmaking at the Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy at the University of Virginia. By way of introductions, I'm Craig Volden, Professor of Public Policy and Politics uh, here at the Batten School. I'm also the co-director of the Center for Effective Lawmaking. I'm delighted to be joined today by Congressman Derek Kilmer. Uh, the Congressman grew up in the state of Washington before going to Princeton to pursue a public policy degree from the Wilson School. So for our policy students in the audience, uh, the Congressman represents another excellent example of what one can do with a policy degree. Uh, he earned his doctorate uh, from Oxford on a Marshall Scholarship and worked as a consultant for McKinsey and Company uh, before taking a further turn toward public service. He was elected to the Washington State Legislature, uh, serving in the House and then the Senate from 2005 to 2013. He was elected to Congress in 2012, uh, and it was during his first term as a member of the House of Representatives that he first appeared on the radar screen of the Center for Effective Lawmaking. Uh, in that term, he scored on our overall top 10 list of most effective Democratic lawmakers in the House, despite only being a freshman. In the current Congress, uh, Representative Kilmer chairs the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress, a committee tasked with recommending reforms to make the House of Representatives work better. And last week, he was reelected for a fifth term in Congress. Congratulations, Mr. Chairman, and welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, the way that we're going to uh, conduct uh, today's interview is that I have an endless number of questions myself about the select committee, uh, but we'll be especially pleased also to ask questions on behalf of our live audience. Uh, for those of you out in the audience, so if you want to put those uh, in the Q&A box uh, down at the bottom, uh, I'll be able to integrate those uh, as we go along. Uh, now, these uh, questions are in many cases going to be fairly general, um, but I'm sure we'd all love to hear from you uh, with specific examples uh, from your work on the select committee uh, as they come to mind. Um, so just to kick it off, uh, how did the select committee come about? What, why now? Yeah, about um, every few decades or so, uh, Congress realizes that things aren't working the way they ought to and they create a select committee to do something about it. And uh, the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress was sort of this year's incarnation uh, of that. If I were to give you a deeper dive into the origin story, um, a lot of it happened prior to the 116th Congress when there was discussion around reforms to the House Rules Package. You had Democrats and Republicans when it wasn't clear who the majority was gonna be talking about how we make the institution function better. Uh, I'm very conscious as a member of Congress that I'm part of an organization that according to recent polling is less popular than head lice, colonoscopies and the band Nickelback. Right. And we would consistently find things that we wanted to get into the rules package as we had these bipartisan conversations. And then every now and then we would unearth an issue, uh, you know, around things like recruitment, retention, and diversity of staff, or how Congress uses technology, or issues around constituent communications, where we would find ourselves saying, well, that's not really a rules issue. Uh, and so we kind of put it in a bucket that we said stuff to be dealt with later. And we took all of that and, and a bipartisan group of us said, maybe it's time to do one of those once in a generation committees again to deal with all that stuff that doesn't fit in the rules package. And so uh, last year when the House passed its rules, uh, it established this committee. And it was established as a bipartisan committee, six Democrats, six Republicans. Uh, we were originally given one year to do our work, then we were extended through the uh, end of the 116th Congress. And you know our mandate is pretty broad and it, it incorporated a number of those things that were kind of in the bucket that I just mentioned of stuff that weren't necessarily House rules issues. You know, and and Candidly, we also looked at some issues that didn't, that weren't part of our mandate, but that we thought were important, things like civility and continuity of con Congress, which is even uh, more important in the midst of a global pandemic. And the common thread here, you know, and I guess this gets at the question of why our work matters, is how do we make Congress work better for the American people? That was uh, our underlying mission, and I think that's actually pretty important. Great. Thanks for that background. Um, as you had mentioned, there have been a number of uh, reform committees uh, and reform attempts through the 
what, 232 years uh, that Congress has been around. Um, were you able to learn from those past efforts in terms of how to move forward um, and, and how to kind of lay out the problem systematically and think through solutions? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and early on, we did uh, a session with the Congressional Research Service and we brought them in and had them kind of walk us through the history of these reform efforts. And it's a pretty mixed bag. And when they, you know, when you hear someone from CRS going through, you know, generations worth of select committees and referring to in the successful committee, you know, 30 years ago, and then, you know, in the failed attempt, and we were like, oh my how goodness. do we make sure we're one of the successful ones <laughs> and not one of the failed ones? And so there was a few things that we did that I actually thought were, were um, useful. You know, one, we actually put our ideas into action. Uh, everything we recommended that committees ought to do to encourage bipartisanship, to encourage collaboration, to encourage productivity, we modeled ourselves. Um, so, you know, a few examples. You know, one of the things we recommended is functional committees off should, you know, and, and frankly, functional organizations should decide, hey, so what's success look like early on? You know, I when I was at McKinsey, I never, you know, worked with a client who didn't define success up front. And so one of the things we recommended was that committees ought to have agenda setting retreats at the beginning to define success and to establish a positive bipartisan approach to working together. We did that. And honestly, we found it wildly uh, uh, helpful. It was really useful to have every member of the committee express, here's why I'm here and here's what I wanna get done. We experimented with some small things, but things that weren't insignificant, like mixed seatings. If you watch uh, one of our hearings on C-SPAN, and I can tell you they were real ratings grabbers. Um, you know, we didn't have Democrats sitting on one side of the dais and Republicans sitting on the other. We had Democrats and Republicans sitting side by side. And, you know, the value of that is you'd be hearing testimony and it enabled you to lean over to the person to your right or to your left and say, that's a really interesting idea. What do you think about that? And it was someone who might have a different perspective than you, but it enabled that kind of bipartisan dialogue and fostered some uh, relationships. You know, my uh, our vice chair was Tom Graves. He and I worked as partners and our, our committee members did the same. We, we formed a number of bipartisan working groups. So, you know, when we uh, wanted to work on the issue of technology, we kind of spun off a Democrat and a Republican to work on that issue together. We had a group that worked on issues around civility together. I guess the only other thing I'll mention is our committee doesn't have legislative authority, but we, you know, again, in looking at some of the failed uh, efforts over the years, one of the things we decided to do was where we could find, a, we, we, um, we passed rolling recommendations. So we didn't just wait till the end of our deadline and try to pass something. I was in fact on a prior select committee that took the approach of waiting till the last meeting, trying to get some recommendations passed. And unfortunately, the you know plane sort of flew into the side of the mountain and that committee got zero recommendations passed. You saw that happen with this, the super committee on debt and deficit reduction. Same thing, they passed zero recommendations. So what we decided to do was two things. One, to figure out where we could find agreement. And we started with some kind of low hanging fruit and then we just rolled on them and passed recommendations. But then importantly, we decided to turn our recommendations into legislation. Uh, our first set of about 30 recommendations passed the House in March. Um, we're currently turning our remaining 97 uh, recommendations um, into legislation. And that this is you know really a first for committees like ours. No other reform committee actually turned recommendations into legislation during its tenure. But we thought that was really important because our goal was not to produce a report. Our goal was to produce change and to make Congress work better. Great. Um, there's a lot to unpack in there. So I'm going to uh, kind of take bits of it. Um, I'm intrigued by the defining success up front. Um, so our students should know that's a great way to proceed. Um, but uh, in particular, then I could imagine that different uh, folks on the committee will have different definitions of success. Uh, did you find that's kind of a brainstorming exercise where uh, let's build a broad list of successes, uh, or did that expose some some potential conflicts? Uh, how did you think about uh, what came out of that process? 
I think what was useful is people came to the exercise, not necessarily with the answer, um, but with uh, issues that they thought were important for our committee uh, to engage on. So for example, um, you had, when we had that initial uh, agenda setting retreat, you had a couple members say, you know what I think is bonkers? I spent more time days traveling, sitting on airplanes and in airports last year than I spent in the United States Capitol. And which was true. Uh, and so you had a couple folks say, I really want to dig into that issue, issues around scheduling and calendar. You had some members say, you know, when we went around and uh, said, um, you know, when we are done, what do you want to make sure we have worked on? You had a couple members say, I think we've had too many government shutdowns and um, I want to deal with issues around budget and appropriations. You had some members say, man, Congress has such wild staff turnover. This is a big problem. And, uh, you know, and so there were there were a number of overarching problems that we unearthed during that uh, agenda setting retreat. And when we, you know, kind of whiteboarded them out, the common denominator of uh, was all of these things contribute to Congress not working well for the American people. And so what we were able to do up front is to say, we all may want to work on different issues, but they're all under the umbrella of Let's make Congress work better for the American people. So I kind of joked at the end of this meet, that meeting, let you know, let's all get tattoos, right? That say, we're here to make Congress work better for the American people. Right, right. Um, and then the bipartisan approach, um, you uh, embraced that from the earliest days. Um, is that just unique to the business of what you were up to of making Congress work better for the American people? Uh, or is kind of bipartisanship something that could work in other committees and other areas of Congress's work? I think it's really important. You know, we made a decision up front. Now, listen, our, our committee was six Democrats and six Republicans. To make a, to pass a recommendation, we required a two thirds vote. And so if I wanted to get anything done, we had to, to, to work together. But, you know, uh, Vice Chair Graves and I made a decision up front. And one of the, one of our, our decisions was a tectonic shift in terms of how Congress generally functions. You know, when you get a committee established, the committee gets its funding. And what generally happens is you divide the money and the Democrats get their part of the money. They generally use their money to hire people who have a democratic background. They put on blue jerseys, you know, Republicans use their part of the money to hire people with a Republican background. They get hired, they put on their red jerseys and then they spend the rest of the time duking it out. And Tom and I had a discussion early on and said, what if we don't do that? You know, what if we just have one nonpartisan unified staff, one budget, one office, and instead of putting on red and blue jerseys, they just, everybody puts on fixed Congress jerseys. And that was a real break from tradition of Congress, but I actually think it was really, really Im important. Um, you know, we also decided to have all of our meetings uh, as a full committee, committee members um, had their staffs briefed as a group. Um, all, you know, all of our information sharing was done on a nonpartisan basis. So we weren't, you know, we kind of weren't separating our efforts in a partisan way. And that meant that some issues needed extra discussion and needed extra attention because we, again, we needed two thirds of the committee to approve any recommendation that we made. You know, not everybody, regardless of party, agrees on everything all of the time. But that meant that every recommendation made had the full support of, of our bipartisan committee, which was, a, which was a big deal. I guess one of the main takeaways is, I actually think that that, that could be instructive for other committees in Congress. But it means everybody has to give a little something up. As a member of the majority party, uh, um, sort of ceding some of our authority as the majority and sharing in the governance of our committee, sharing in the agenda setting of our committee meant giving something up, but it also meant getting something. And frankly, it meant the minority had to give something up too. What they had to give up is there was an expectation that if they had skin in the game, that there was an expectation that they couldn't just vote no. And that is sometimes the challenge in 
the Congress right now is if you disempower the minority so much, no wonder they just vote no on everything. And I, I think that the approach of our committee could be really instructive in terms of how other committees could function better. Uh, can you give me an example or two of uh, here's a proposal, it didn't meet the two thirds threshold, let's talk it through and revise it and kind of build that consensus? How, how does that work in concrete terms? Well, there were a couple that were hard, um, you know, more than a couple. Uh, you know, one of the issues that we looked at was just the the funding that were, was provided to congressional member offices. You know, that's a hot button issue, regardless of what side of the aisle you're on. But, you know, we got, we brought in outside experts, we talked to staff, we talked to members and former members, and we knew that one of the most important reforms we could recommend was to actually increase investment in the legislative branch. That That's, that's hard, right? That's tricky. And so that took a lot of discussion about, okay, how, what's the best way to do that? And how do we do it in a way that if you're a conservative Republican, you're not, you know, touching a third rail in terms of um, asking, you know, for Congress and, and the legislative branch to get more funding. And, you know, part of the way we did that is we grounded it in the Constitution, right? Article one of the Constitution sets up the legislative branch as a co-equal branch of government. And unfortunately, you have um, seen a complete erosion uh, of its capacity. And so it wasn't simply seen as some self-serving move uh, to increase congressional capacity. It was seen as a desire for the legislative branch to fulfill its constitutional obligation. You know, another good example of that is what we called the community um, focused grant program, which was a framework to re-empower Congress to make decisions about how money gets spent. And, you know, uh, none of us wanted to repeat the um, some of the abuses that you saw with earmarks in prior uh, decades. But we also felt it was important from, again, from a constitutional standpoint to have Congress use the power of the purse that was established for it under the constitution. We worked together you know, with leaders on both sides of the aisle to create something that could be implemented, that would be accessible for all members, that would be transparent, that would be um, have protections against abuse, and that would make Congress work better for the American people. And I, I you know, those were hard, right? Like that, that process, you know, took the better part of a year for us to land on a recommendation that our members were comfortable with, um, and that we could get that we could find common ground on. But that's, uh, you know, being able to provide bipartisan recommendations in that space, I thought was really important. Right. That's great. Thanks for that uh, set of examples. Um, and then presumably there were some where some subset of the select committee thought this is a wonderful idea, but uh, just couldn't get consensus altogether. Um, how often did you find that happening? There were some issues that weren't necessarily prescribed uh, in, in the rule that set up our committee, but that clearly contribute to dysfunction in Congress. Some of the broader systemic issues like campaign finance issues and partisan gerrymandering. You know, we had a discussion in one of our meetings to say, is there any appetite for taking on these issues? And it was pretty clear early on, we're just not gonna get, we're not gonna be able to drive consensus on, on those issues. There were some issues that we were able to make recommendations on that were probably more general than some members wanted to get. You know, issues around schedule and calendar are a good example of that, where we had some members who came in saying, I know exactly the congressional calendar that I would like to see, and I think we should recommend that. And we just weren't able to kind of land the plane mm -hmm. uh, on that with the level of specificity. We were able to say, you know, we think Congress should have more days legislating than travel days. And we think that there is value in having some weeks, for example, where uh, Congress only does committee work. And then some weeks where Congress uh, only is on the floor or is predominantly on the floor. Because right now, you don't always see the most optimal use of time. And, uh, you know, um, I think it was, uh, 
maybe 2018, there were 65 uh, travel days, no, excuse me, 66 travel days and 65 full days uh, in Congress. You know, which means one, members weren't there all that much and we're spending a lot of time in airports and on airplanes. And then on top of that, uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center did a really thoughtful analysis where they looked at, you know, the degree to which uh, committee meetings are on top of each other, in part because if you're not there enough, the average member, I think, is on 5.2 uh, committees and subcommittees. And, you know, if you're only there 65 full days, all of those committee meetings are basically scheduled on top of each other. So oftentimes, mm -hmm. if you're watching C-SPAN, one, why? But secondly, if you're watching C-SPAN and you notice that there's not that many people who are at their committee meeting, it's not that they're blowing off their job. It's that you know, they're in three committees at the same time. And, you know, and my clone doesn't come to work, right? So, um, so we thought it was important to make uh, recommendations in that space, and we did. So we suggested, you know, both in terms of overall trying to have Congress there more often, to having a sort of central scheduling system so that committees could at least try to deconflict some of their committee meetings. Um, we made this recommendation on having Congress, you know, have some days that were designated as committee days and some as, as, as floor days. Having said that, you know, there were members of the committee who wanted to get far more prescriptive than we were really to find consensus. Uh, I want to bring in some audience questions. Again, you can uh, ask those in the Q&A box. Um, but this uh, one here is asking kind of about uh, where, where policy ideas come from or reform ideas. Was there a process uh, for identifying issues other than what members themselves think are important? Uh, and how did that play out? Yeah, we had uh, uh, we had a lot of partners in this exercise. Um, first and foremost, we started off with uh, soliciting ideas from members. We did a member day hearing. We had, you know, several dozen members show up. And, you know, it's when you crowdsource in, in that way, you, you, you just started coming up with the laundry list of things that you're like, well, that, you know, that, that'd be a good thing for us to take a look at, too. We had a former member day hearing and, you know, talked to members of Congress who left and, tried to unearth, so why'd you leave and what were some of the problems that you identified? Um, we also leaned on political scientists quite a lot. You know, we had, you know, in the rule that established our committee, we had a specific mandate to look at a number of issues. You know, so technology as an example, and, um, you know, between, uh, you know, ac folks from academia, um, to folks in the kind of reform nonprofit arena. Uh, I, I guess I didn't fully realize until I became chair of this committee, you know, there's a group that is kind of known as the cohort, but I lovingly refer to as the reform industrial complex. But there's, a, you know, there, there's a, a, an amazing number of really effective, thoughtful organizations that are really focused on some of the dysfunction in our politics and in the legislative branch in particular. And they were extraordinary partners in saying, hey, you know, you've been assigned this task. We've been doing this work looking at that issue. Let's make some, you know, we'd be happy to come and testify. And, and that was really quite constructive. You know, I, I, I joke about the lack of ratings that we got on, on C-SPAN. Our, our committee while important was not exactly viral on social media. Um, but it's kind of a bummer because the reality is in, you know, I would encourage folks who are interested in our work, you should watch some of our hearings. They were really interesting, you know, as, as and I don't just say that as a policy nerd, I say that as someone who um, wants to see government work better. And, you know, bringing in these experts who would come and talk to us about you know, a variety of issues, it was really instructive and really helped inform the 97 recommendations that we were able to pass with with um, unanimous support. Right. I mean, it, it seems like uh, having uh, seen many of those, uh, you didn't get the yelling at each other part that maybe uh, would give you high ratings and so on. You got the constructive policy wonk work, uh, which is uh, sadly underappreciated. 
Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. But I, uh, I, there was, all, no, there was sorry, also yeah. one uh, focused on uh, reforms that uh, that might have been tried in the states. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, was that useful? Does Congress draw some lessons from state legislatures and so on? Yeah, for sure. Um, on on a number of fronts, the you know probably the area that you saw the most. Um, where we dug in the most was after COVID hit, uh, just trying to understand how, how do functional legislative bodies continue to function even in the midst of a global pandemic. Um, we were able to, to draw on not just the experience of state, legislator, state legislatures, but also um, across the globe, uh, talking to parliamentary bodies about how they were continuing to work. I'm always intrigued when we interview members of Congress and they say, well, I wish it worked the way that it worked back in my state when I was in the state legislature. Um, you know, some, sometimes that, that doesn't play out the same way. Yeah, it was kind of a shock to my system. I haven't come from a mostly functional state legislature um, and we were able to pull some recommendations. Again, you know, not to um, uh, beat the drum on on the schedule and calendar issue, but you know, like the many of us who came from state legislatures, you know, came from systems that had block scheduling as an example. So you had some right. deconfliction uh, on that front. Um, you know, and some of the other recommendations that we made, you know, dealing with civility and trying to foster more partisan bipartisan collaboration um you know came again from people's experiences in state legislatures you know um one of the areas where we made a recommendation was you know really from day one when you're elected to congress you're separated by party you know there are parts of orientation that are partisan and we recommended that that change, you know, this year new member orientation, which is happening as we speak, is nonpartisan. You know, that's a huge win for the House and, and, and for those that we serve. I mean, literally you had people say, I got to Congress and Democrats were put on one bus and Republicans were put on another bus. Um, you know, we also, many of us from legislative bodies said, there needs to be some space where members can engage one another in a bipartisan way. You know, they're, they're in our member day hearing, that was one of the recommendations that came up. Dean Phillips from Minneapolis, from no, not from Minneapolis, from Minnesota uh, though, um, he came and testified, you know, he was a business guy and he said, you know, no 21st century institution would use space the way that Congress does. <laughs> and he said, you know, there should be, there should be a space away from press, away from outside groups, away from staff, where con Congress members could work together, you know, without judgment or without outside influence and just be able to talk. Um, so we made a recommendation along those lines. So the uh, newer list, you said 97 recommendations. What's, what's the status or uh, state of, of that longer list? Yeah, so last year we turned 30 of our recommendations into legislative text um, that was passed overwhelmingly by the House uh, back in March. Uh, uh, and then this, you know, and that's the first time that a select committees like ours turned recommendations into legislative action. So that was a big deal. Um, we're in the process of turning our remaining recommendations into legislation. We're working on that right now. You know, and some of it may be in the form of, you know, the, the prior one was HRES 756. Some of them may be kind of a house resolution. Some of them, some of our recommendations will, will require legislation that would pass the house, pass the Senate and get signed by the president. That's harder, but um, you know, so for example, we made seven recommendations related to budget and appropriations process reforms, you know, shifting to biennial budgeting as an example and trying to improve the coordination between the legislative branch and the executive branch uh, in that budget uh, process. Uh, you know, that would actually require uh, uh, legislation that passes the House, passes the Senate and gets signed by the president. Some of it can be dealt with in the rules package. So, you know, literally earlier, early two days ago, I was on uh, a phone call with Chairman McGovern, the chair of the rules committee saying, here's some of the recommendations that we made. We think some of these things could be dealt with in the rules package, uh, you know, and, 
and literally could be wins that um, get put up on the board uh, on day one of the 117th Congress. Right. So this is a group we're not expecting those 97 to come together as uh, as a single resolution, but those are parceled out in a variety of ways. They may come together predominantly in a resolution, but um, some of them will take more than just a HRES. Okay. Uh, I want to bring in another audience question. Um, one extremely impressed by all of the work and the consensus of the select committee. Uh, as you contemplate future iterations of a select committee, would you reconsider the rule requiring approval of at least two thirds of the committee to report recommendations? It seems like this will be a limiting factor or a ceiling on some of the more ambitious Article One reform priorities. Uh, has that been discussed among colleagues? I think as we look, so let me talk about the two thirds issue and then talk about future iterations. Mm -hmm. I think there was value in acknowledging upfront that if you're gonna do systemic reform, it has to be bipartisan. Because as you may have noticed, there's not a tremendous amount of trust in the marble buildings in our nation's capital. And there's a real tendency to view reforms as something that would be um, seeking to advantage or disadvantage one side or the other. That is, um, uh, that's murder on a reform process. So you, mm -hmm. you, you, you have to have not just the perception, you have to have the reality that, uh, that this is about institutional improvement, not advantaging one party or the other. Which is not to say that there aren't issues that uh, I would like to see Congress take on. You know, I'm a proud Democrat. I, I think our campaign finance system is completely bonkers. And, you know, I would love to see uh, Congress take on that issue. I'm not sure that that's something that could get two thirds vote. Congress should should still take it up. In fact, the House last year or two years ago passed HR uh, one, the For the People Act. That was not a bipartisan bill, though. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there has been some discussion about extending the work of the committee, and um, I'll say sort of two things about that. One. I think a functional organization looks at its performance more than once uh, in a bloom, you know, at once in a generation. Um, yeah, I think I'm a believer in kind of continual process improvement. And, you know, so there's been some discussion around continuing the committee's work. Beyond that, uh, I think there's also some recognition that at some point there would be value in having a bicameral conversation because mm -hmm. much of the dysfunction that you've seen is not unique to the House, but is uh, the House Senate dynamic. And I don't know if that'll happen, but I think at some point it ought to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so here at the Center for Effective Lawmaking, we're we were pleased to see that there was quite a bit of alignment between uh, the recommendations of your committee uh, and the findings that have been emerging from our research. Uh, so I'd like to explore a few areas of overlap um, along those lines. Uh, at the center, we found, for example, uh, that uh, legislators who are more bipartisan, uh, such as those attracting a greater proportion of cross-party co-sponsors to their bills, are more effective at moving their proposals uh, forward through the lawmaking process. And uh, of course, a number of your reforms are pointing towards bipartisanship as well. Um, of course, at the same time, we're seeing bipartisanship declining over the past uh, few decades. Um, as you were diving in, um, what did you see as kind of some of the causes of that decline in bipartisanship uh, maybe over the past two, three decades? Uh, and then what specific recommendations might help uh, on that dimension? How much can you chip away at uh, some of those partisan problems? Yeah. In terms of diagnosing the problem, I think there's a few things that uh, come into play. One, Congress is more polarized because the American people are more po polarized. That's that's harder, right? The the you know, I still remember my first week in Congress uh, uh, in 2013. I, I mentioned you go through freshman orientation, and uh, then the first week I was on the Armed Services Committee in my first term in Congress, and they had all the freshman members on Armed Services, 
and on foreign affairs, go to the Pentagon and meet with the military leadership. And we took a bus back from the Pentagon and it rolled into the Capitol at about seven o'clock at night. And I stood up on the bus as it rolled in and said, hey, I'm gonna go grab a burger if anyone wants to come in part because you know it was my first week on the job and I'm trying to make new friends. And we had three Democrats and three Republicans go up to Good Stuff Burgers on Pennsylvania Avenue. And we're sitting there and we had, you know, just talking, you know, tell me about your race. How did you get in? And, you know, what do you want to do? And you know, about 45 minutes in, I said something along the lines of, you know, it seems like we ought to be able to, you know, get some stuff done. And the guy sitting across the table from me, it just so happened he was a, a, a very conservative Republican from a deep red district. I, I, unfortunately, I can probably tell this story with someone from a deep blue district. It wasn't. It was a guy from a deep red district. And he said, Derek, I really like you. Uh, he said, in fact, I, I uh, his, par his parents used to live in my district. He said, I, mm -hmm. I reached out to my parents after orientation said, you know, you seem to be represented by what seems, what seems to be a pretty good guy. And I said, well, thank you for that. And he said, now here's what you don't understand. He said, I won my seat by running against the incumbent Republican. I ran against him as being too compromising, too willing to work with Democrats. And he said, and I was applauded in my district for that. And in fact, beat him because of that. He said, the first vote I cast when I got to Congress was a vote against John Boehner for Speaker of the House. And he said, and I sent out a press release after that vote saying I voted against him because he's too compromising, too willing to work with Democrats. And he said, here's what you don't get. He said, I like you, but my constituents didn't send me here to work with you. They sent me here to stop you. And I walked out of that burger joint and I called up my wife on my way back to my cheap apartment. And I said, I've got two reactions to this. One, <laughs> how incredibly honest and forthcoming. And secondly, oh my God, right? Like that is a real problem. Yeah. And, you know, that is a problem that is somewhat um, outside the scope of just our committee that gets at everything like, you know, into issues like partisan gerrymandering, um, you know, and, 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 to the state of our, our discourse, right? Where if compromise is viewed as, or, or working across the aisle is viewed as toxic with the base of your party, um, uh, that's, you know, the incentives are a bit out of whack right now politically. Um, I'm not, uh, there's a longer discussion to have about what to do about that. Sure. But one of the things that we recognized on the committee was also, you know, you asked about sort of what, what has caused that decline. You know, one of the things is relationships really matter. You know, the fact that Congress is now, you know, really a commuter Congress, and there's not really much time to form relationships and to foster civility. It's a lot easier to say terrible things about a colleague if you don't have a personal relationship with them. Um, you know, you see a, a, a lot more of that. And so one of our committee members, Emmanuel Cleaver from Missouri, was really passionate about trying to improve civility and relationships through, throughout the legislative branch. And he worked with Susan Brooks, who's a Republican from Indiana, to, to develop and to really prioritize a bunch of recommendations aimed at boosting bipartisanship. You know, I mentioned the proposed reforms uh, around um, orientation. Uh, we made the recommendation around finding member space for people uh, to collaborate. You know, the the recommendations around congressional schedule and calendar might seem kind of, you know, if 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 you haven't been in the thick of it, you might find yourself wondering like, why why is this committee even dealing with that? Well, here's the thing: if members spend so much time in airports and on airplanes rather than legislating and getting to know each other, right? Like that does not make Congress work better for the American people. So our, our hope and, uh, you know, my least favorite question that I've gotten since I've been working on this committee is like, so what's the one recommendation that's more important than any other? And the <laughs> question is, you know, there's not one thing that broke it, right? And the, you know, I don't think that there's a silver bullet. I think it's more like silver buckshot, right? Like there's a whole bunch of stuff you gotta do to, you know, to yield, you know, better bipartisan policies and a less toxic environment. Great, thanks for that. Um, 
Our work at the center has also shown that uh, members of Congress who specialize and gain expertise in a particular policy area tend to be more effective than generalist legislators kind of who spread their uh, legislative portfolio across many policy areas. Uh, and yet at the same time, uh, we've seen that specialization and expertise uh, over recent decades decline with a rise in generalists, people who are putting out issues across many, many different policy areas. How does the select committee think about policy expertise in Congress and what can be done to promote more expert lawmaking? Well, I mentioned, you know, one issue is that Congress actually needs to invest in itself as an institution. I, I don't just mean that in the form of funding, but in the way we learn and encourage members and encourage staff to continue learning on behalf of the folks that we serve. Um, if you look at the trend line, and I really do encourage folks who are watching this. Um, our, our final report is at modernizedcongress.gov, um, I think. Um, I'll check that before we- We'll put that up as well. Um, there's a lot of great data in you know, looking at how Congress is sort of disinvested in itself as an institution. And you know, it's sort of self-lobotomizing, right? You saw Congress you know, uh, abolish um, uh, the Office of Technology Assessment, which was right. focused on how Congress understands technology issues. And it's no wonder that you then have, uh, you know, the Facebook hearings where, you know, that wasn't a great day, that wasn't a great look for, for Congress in terms of its capacity on issues of technology. You know, Congress was established as the first among co-equal branches of government. It's expected to resolve public problems through legislating, through budgeting, through holding hearings, through conducting oversight. So we looked at congressional capacity in a way, you know, in the way that committees are structured and run. We made recommendations that we think would help committees and committee members be more effective in their jobs. You know, and that included recommendations on training. Uh, on debate and deliberation, because you know none of us are taught that here in Congress, and we learn by doing it, and often by example. And sometimes the examples are are bad. We also made recommendations to encourage bipartisan, evidence-based policymaking, similar to how our committee conducted hearings and meetings over the last uh, two years. Um, we also made recommendations specific to you know enabling professional development both of staff and of members of Congress. Congress is unique. I mean, I, I, it's the first public setting that I've worked in that doesn't really have any means of professional development for sitting members of Congress. You're required to take, uh, you know, sort of an ethics training and, and now thankfully, and I think it's a good thing, training around um, treatment of staff and trying to prevent workplace harassment, uh, you know, that's important, but there are also, trainings that I think would be value around just being good at your job. And that doesn't really happen. I saw, and that is different than in the state legislature. So I remember becoming a committee chair in the state legislature. And the first thing I did was reach out to the National uh, Conference of State Legislatures and said, do you have anything on best practices for being a good committee chair? Because I finally got a gavel and I don't want to stink at it. <laughs> Right. And, you know, they, this is, you know, this gives you some sense of how long ago this was. I think it was 2007. You know, they sent me CDs, you know, that I listened to on my drive from home to Olympia on how to be a good committee chair. But you know yeah. what? It was great. Right. And <laughs> we don't have that in this environment. And so, one, you know, some of the recommends that recommendations that we, we made were in the spirit of that. Uh, and, and these support institutions, you mentioned the Office of Technology Assessment, you've mentioned CRS, uh, others, how, how are they working? What could be done to, to help them? Yeah, so we made recommendations on that front too, you know, to restore the Office of Technology Assessment in a reformed way, but, but you know, really trying to get at that loss of capacity. Um, you know, the, 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 it was clear that Congress sort of needs to restore its capacity as an institution, both with those standalone uh, uh, ent entities like OTA and CRS, but also within um, within offices, right? Within committees and within offices. You know, the, the people who work for Congress, 
both members and staff are, you know, in my observation, dedicated public servants who want to do right by the American people. They work on the Hill because they're interested in making a difference. You know, they're certainly not there for the paycheck or, or for cushy benefits. But I think it's really hard for people to be fully invested in their work if their work isn't fully invested in them. You know, successful institutions, whether you're talking about businesses or nonprofits or government, you know, they depend on people who are invested in the work that they're doing. And that's fundamental. And uh, successful institutions invest in themselves. They invest in their employees. They invest in their infrastructure. And they invest in the overall work environment and the experience. And they, 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 they plan with an eye towards that. And so we made recommendations along those lines. You know, and again, not one of these is like, well, that's the silver bullet, but they're, they matter. So, you know, one of the recommendations we made was to offer staff certifications in addition to trainings through, there's a congressional staff academy so that you could actually, you know, sort of build up your resume as someone who works in this environment and learn more. You know, we um, made a recommendation around providing institution-wide some standard onboarding training for new employees, um, including the required training, you know, but I think probably the most important thing is we made a recommendation to reevaluate the funding formula and increase the funds to each member office. Because what we've seen is, you know, the average tenure of a position in a congressional office is, uh, is two years. And what that means is we're outgunned you know, the, the, as an institution, you know, it means we're often overly reliant on the executive branch uh, and as an institution on lobbyists. And I would argue that that does not best serve the interests of the American people. And that's why you saw Democrats and Republicans support the recommendations that we made around in investing in this institution. It wasn't in a self-serving way. It was a recognition that, um, grounded in the uh, Constitution and in Congress's Article I role, we simply have to improve capacity of the legislative branch or we're really hosed. That's a legislative technical term. Yeah, I bet. Um, so uh, diving into that idea of, uh, of supporting staff some more, that also aligns with our research. For example, we had found that uh, freshman members who hire uh, staff, uh, legislative staff who have uh, lots of experience already on Capitol Hill kind of hit the ground running. They behave more like they're in their third or fourth term than in their first term. Uh, and yet the, the number they have to choose from, as you're suggesting, with so much staff turnover uh, is, is smaller and smaller. Um, you know, what, in addition to the proposals that you've, uh, you've been making there, um, there are some long serving staff. Uh, what did you find kind of motivated them to stay on Capitol Hill and how can we reinforce kind of what, what they found to be successful? I think those that stay have a sense of efficacy, you know, and so, you know, to, to the extent that Congress can get things done, uh, I think that helps us hang on to staff. Um, you mentioned some of the long tenured staff. One of the limitations that we have right now is that staff pay is capped at member pay. And you can understand that and, and listen, when we did our member day hearing, we did have some members show up and testify, we want this committee to make a recommendation to raise pay for members of Congress. Mm -hmm. our, our committee did not do that. Uh, but we did make a recommendation saying that staff pay should not be capped at member pay. Because if Congress doesn't have the will, the desire, the, you know, the political will, if they don't want to touch that third rail around member pay, it should not impede the ability to hang on to really talented, uh, in many cases, as you mentioned, long tenured people who at some point are just hitting the ceiling and have no choice but to, you know, go hop to a job, you know, most commonly on K Street. Yeah, yeah. Um, the discussion that we had earlier uh, about broader reforms, um, you know, getting the Senate involved, um, you know, pa passing legislation that the president would have to sign and so on. Um, what have you found just in discussions of appetite for a similar committee or something on the Senate side? 
we've had a few discussions with folks who are um, who are looking at that. I think right now there's a lot of uncertainty about what the Senate looks like next year. Yeah. So um, until that uh, settles a little bit, that's hard to say. But I think there's a lot of work to get done in the legislative branch. We we and we got a lot done over the past couple of years, and a lot of the problems that Congress faces just they don't have quick solutions. And so you know, I mentioned this earlier. I, I don't think this should be a once every few decades exercise. You know, I I, I think this should be a bigger priority for Congress to look at. You know how do you, how do you adjust how things get done just as a matter of course and my observation is that's generally what functional organizations do mm -hmm. um so we'll we'll see i mean i i i know that there's a, a push um uh by many to continue the work of of this committee i i think that's a personally i think that's a good idea um i know that there are some who've said um, maybe there's a, a bicameral opportunity. I, I think if it's possible, that would be a good idea. Obviously, it takes it takes two to tango, and there's a you know, and, and the house maybe a couple years ahead in the in the process just um, because of the work of the committee of the last couple of years. But I, I think you know, and this may sound self serving, but I think we set a really great example for how members can work productively and with civility across party lines, and that's no small thing. You know, partic particularly given how politically tumultuous the past year or so have been. I mean, this committee functioned, one, this committee functioned, right. and two, this committee functioned in the midst of impeachment, in the midst of a government shutdown, in the midst of a global pandemic. And I know it's, you know, um, again, it, that's not leading the evening news, but there have been, and I give you credit, I'm grateful that you're paying attention to it. There have been people who've paid attention to it. And I think, I think that matters. Well, I think modeling that behavior uh, and showing that it works as an alternative model uh, se seems to be really important. I do too. Um, another uh, question from our audience. Uh, does the election uh, of a president and vice president as two legislators who have long defended legislative prerogatives create any opportunities to affirm Congress's Article I powers, uh, either on budget or arms control uh, and so on? I really hope so. Uh, my sense is, uh, so let, let me sort of separate out first the president-elect and, and the vice president-elect. I think there's value in doing kind of an act after action report on, on the Trump presidency to look at some of the issues that arose with regard to the erosion of Article I authorities. You saw, for example, uh, the Trump administration on any, on any number of issues on, certainly on appropriating where, you know, despite having not uh, passed funding for a wall out of any appropriations bill, um, you, you saw the administration pull money for that purpose. You saw, you know, on trade policy actions that really usurped the role of the legislative branch. And so I, I think there's real value in looking systemically at some of those Article I issues. And I, again, I'm not saying that in a partisan way, and that's not meant to be some sort of a, a shot at the Trump administration. It's just a statement of reality. They did that. And so I think, you know, even without, re with, without regard to who Joe Biden is and to who Kamala Harris is, I think there's value in looking at those issues. I think we'll find more fertile terrain because of the backgrounds of the president-elect and the vice president-elect to take on those issues. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, our time's running a bit short, but I wanted to make sure there was time for you to uh, raise anything else uh, that you're interested in talking about here and prospects for the future. Well, I, I guess I'd love to just say one, thanks uh, for your interest in this. I, 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 um, I think it matters, uh, you know, and I, I, I really encourage for those who are watching who are students, frankly, we need you, uh, you know, we need your good ideas um, from a public policy standpoint and from the standpoint of coming up with recommendations for effective lawmaking. 
so that we have uh, legislative bodies that work better for the American people. I guess the other thing I would mention is just keep the faith. I think it's really easy to watch cable news and quickly get stomach upset. Um, or, you know, if you're following politics on Twitter, um, you know, that can be uh, alarming. You know, er early on in the last couple of years, someone gave me a quote from uh, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. And he said, there's a difference between optimism and hope. Optimism is the belief that things will get better. It's a passive virtue. He said, hope is an active virtue. It's the belief that together we can make things better. He said, it doesn't take courage to have optimism, but it does take courage to have hope. And frankly, when I meet with public policy students, when I meet with those who are actually actively engaged in, in the process of trying to just make things work better, that gives me hope because it's it recognizes that we're not passive observers in this undertaking, that we actually have some say in it. So I encourage you to recognize that one of the cool things about our system of government is you do have a say in it. The only other thing I wanna mention is, um, you know, and I shared this in the final, uh, uh, meeting of uh, the committee. Um, um, and it, this wasn't from me, this was a former HHS secretary, and I can't remember his name. But he spoke about, you know, one of the, the values of, of reform and of trying to make things better. And he talked about the importance of being a loving critic. That, you know, um, you know, there are people who are un uncritical lovers who basically, you know, think everything's hunky-dory and are not, you know, and are, are content with the status quo that too often isn't working for people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, you know, there are also un unloving critics who, and you see this in politics a lot, folks who, you know, you can score points by bashing an institution relentlessly. Uh, but you know the notion of being a loving critic is acknowledging that we have to care enough about an institution to fix it and we have to look at it with a critical enough eye to identify things that aren't working and things that are and commit ourselves to making the types of improvements that the american people deserve so as you engage in this discussion around effective lawmaking and uh, and institutional effectiveness, I hope you do so with an eye towards being a critical lover because um, you really do need to have both. Happy to be in the, what, 9% who love the work of Congress or what it could be, <laughs> uh, perhaps that's a better way to put it. Uh, well, I'm not sure really... I'm in, the, I'm, not, I'm not sure even I'm in the bucket of people who, <laughs> who are, um, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is it's okay to be critical of the institution yeah. Uh, and in fact, if you're not critical of the institution given its current function, what's wrong with you? But you have to care enough about it to want to fix it, not just to treat it like the pinata at the party. Perfect. Well, we really appreciate the service that you've been doing through your committee work, as well as your time here with us today. Um, for those who are interested in <clears throat> continuing to follow uh, this work, go to modernizecongress.house.gov. Uh, for the select committee work uh, and go to thelawmakers.org uh, for more on the Center for Effective Lawmaking. Thanks once again. Thank you.